What are the three tribes of martial arts and do we owe allegiance to any of them? My name is Jamie Club from Club Carmira Martial Arts. If you like the content of this vlog, please like, subscribe and leave a comment below. Hello, so the three tribes, the three camps, the three ways of thinking. Traditionalism, modernism, postmodernism. That's a philosophical point of view. Martial arts, traditional martial arts, reality-based self-defense, and combat sports. Examples of each of these areas. Traditional martial arts, Aikido, Karate, Wing Chun, Kudo, Tai Chi Chuan. Reality-based self-defense, Defendu, Bartitsu, Krav Maga, Sistema. Combat sports, mixed martial arts, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, Western boxing, Western wrestling, Greco Roman wrestling. Traditional martial arts offer many different benefits and make many different claims to state their superiority over other martial arts systems. Their main argument is that they have a complete comprehensive package of handling violence. They have a system of tenants, uh, a code in place that ensures that students not only learn uh, combative skills, but they learn not to misuse those combative skills and ultimately their training is towards becoming better people. It becomes a system for self-improvement. Reality-based self-defense puts over the argument that they get straight to the problem at hand. They are dealing with modern violence, the type of violence that you'll be dealing with uh, in a real-life situation, uh, without any of the trappings and rituals of traditional martial arts, and without any of the restrictions of a combat sport. Combat sports put it quite clear, no rituals or trappings really much from the traditional side of martial arts, uh, no uh, pretensions about dealing with real life situations, quite simply you will learn how to fight and you will be fighting other fighters under resistance on a regular basis and sometimes in a competitive environment. Each different camp puts forward certain popular arguments representing their approach as being the most virtuous when it comes to dealing with violence. Uh, traditional martial artists will often argue that they train to be peaceful warriors. They train for violence so they won't ever have to face violence. Uh, to the point where many of them don't even want to talk about violence. And they'd rather be just talking about uh, perfecting the art. Perfecting the art for the art's sake. Uh, again, they, they often um, cite previous warriors, previous uh, representatives of their system that put forward philosophical ideas. And a lot of what they teach sometimes is interwoven or is connected to philosophical teachings from different religions and uh, different uh, philosophies. Then you have reality-based self-defense and their virtue begins and ends with what they believe to be being honest about handling violence and getting you home safely. Combat sports is tied up with sportsmanship, of course, and the virtues and ethics connected to that particular approach to at physical activities. So they will extol the virtues of physical exercise, uh, gaining confidence and the honest appraisal of being able to face another fighter within a testing environment. And so we move on to popular criticism put forward by the three camps. Traditional martial artists look down on reality-based self-defense and combat sports as limited systems and don't see them as real martial arts. Uh, both two camps don't necessarily reject the accusation that they're not real martial arts because they don't want necessarily the connection with martial arts and the trappings if it means traditional martial arts. Traditional martial artists see their systems as being completely comprehensive and that the other two systems are very limited. They see reality-based self-defense to be an obsession over something isn't necessarily likely to happen and those practicing reality-based self-defense are doing so in a state of paranoia, um, exerting uh, too much energy and effort into something that is not really likely to happen in the developed world, whereas they could be getting the full benefits of practicing a traditional system, the underpinning philosophy and the sheer enjoyment of perfecting the various different drills, katas, forms, etc. 
Reality-based self-defense looks upon traditional martial arts as being outmoded, archaic, and impractical. They see their techniques as coming from either a bygone age or have been practiced too long within formal lines and formal settings to become useless in a real-life situation. Uh, therefore, they see the practice of it to be either unnecessary um, or to be downright dangerous, giving people a false sense of security. They look upon combat sports uh, with all their rules and the confines of working within a competitive environment to be the complete opposite to what a real life situation looks like. Uh, they believe that by practicing the way that they practice, they're doing, they're working in the here and now, the reality, they're dealing with the actual problem of handling violence and a combat sport uh, simply isn't doing that with the presence of referees, with the trappings of all the different rule sets that are there and uh, the way that uh, sports people will adapt to the environments that they're training and fighting in. The sports people, the combat sports people, look upon the other two camps again as being unnecessary from their point of view. They see the traditional martial arts for um, being impractical. They see the rituals and even uh, criticise the ideas that uh, religious and philosophical ideas are being put upon uh, people who are training to fight uh, to be uh, potentially damaging. Uh, they see reality-based self-defence again in the same light as traditional martial artists as being uh, an obsession over dealing with real life situations but they also heavily criticise the vast majority of reality based self defence uh, practitioners for not properly pressure testing uh, that often they're doing a lot of scenario based work or they're training against heavily padded people who aren't offering any form of proper resistance whereas they are fighting real fighters they're fighting people who are trained to fight uh, and therefore are a higher calibre of opponent than what you uh, typically find in a real life situation uh, so they think that um, the skills that you're going to learn in a combat sport will certainly be more beneficial from either a traditional martial arts point of view or the world of reality-based self-defense. The problem is that despite the validity to some of these arguments, there are too many exceptions to the rule within the three different schools of thought. There are too many traditional martial artists that have good self-protection knowledge, teaching and experience as well as a firm background in sport and obviously are the exemplification of a traditional martial art. Karate is a great example of that. Karate started as a system of civilian self-defense in Okinawa. Uh, it was a system of cross-training uh, that came from China and indigenous Okinawan systems such as tea and aspects maybe of tagumi. So you have a system that all its founders state its intentions were for self-defense, was for self-protection. You'll find that even its modern pioneers over in Japan, people like uh, Funakoshi when he moved to Japan and Mabuni, uh, put forward the argument that karate was a system of self-protection. And they put forward many arguments that are put forward by certain reality self-defense people. So... There you have it. Karate was a reality-based self-defense system of its time. It began that way. Whether it uh, ended up turning into that is another argument altogether. It became a traditional martial art, and, but it origin originated as a system of reality-based self-defense. They also have a large sporting component. Karate has its traditional point kumite. It's freestyle karate, it's full contact karate, started in the 1960s, and independently of that, the Japanese kickboxing, which was also a fusion of karate and Western boxing. You then have Dutch kickboxing, which might be seen as an interpretation of Muay Thai, but remember it was started by Kyokushin Karateka, as was Kudo, a form of mixed martial arts, which again seeks to retain much of the trappings of traditional karate in a full contact environment that allows for headbutting and and ground fighting as well. And then of course we have the traditional knockdown karate which has always been a part of Masoyama's uh, Kyokushin karate. Then we have Sanda and Sanshu which might be seen as a Chinese variation of kickboxing, a Chinese interpretation of Muay Thai. But that isn't really fair or accurate. Not only does Sanda and Sanshu have their own distinctive rule sets, the sport is considered to be one half of competitive wushu, the other being the more famous taolu or forms. There are even some exceptions in the heavily criticised traditional martial arts of Tai Chi Chuan and Aikido. I've seen good examples of practitioners of these arts who uh, compete 
um, to do a form of um, competition, full contact competition, and also are heavily invested in looking at realistic self-protection in a way that isn't out of alignment with the best teachers of self-protection, certainly self-protection teachers that I respect highly. When we look at this, this whole argument, we find that in the traditional martial arts world, uh, some of the criticism is valid, a lot of it's valid, and it's, uh, it's a fair point made against a large percentage of traditional martial artists, but there are many exceptions to the rule, and there's plenty within the traditional martial arts framework that allows for good self-protection training, good reality-based self-defense, and valid sports training as well that many people involved in the sports field uh, wouldn't uh, find disagreement with. In the reality-based self-defense world, well, I look towards my influences and my inspiration and uh, the people who got me involved in the reality self-defense side of things. Um, I don't like that title anymore, but by the way, but people who got me involved in self-protection and were people who started off in traditional martial arts, often put forward the values of traditional martial arts uh, and uh, to talk about things from a traditional martial arts point of view, cross-trained heavily in combat sports. I often think that people involved in uh, the sports side of, uh, of martial arts, the combat sport uh, camp, uh, when they criticise the reality-based self-defence world, they make the assumption that uh, the main people who are teaching self-protection, the main people who are teaching the self um, reality-based self-defence, have only trained within that area, um, don't really pressure test much, you know, they'll, they'll go off and do maybe a lot of heavy press pressure testing over in Israel or something, but they won't come back and continue that regular pressure testing within their own clubs um, and on a regular basis. It'll just be a, uh, a, a, a once a year kind of thing. Um, but the pioneers in the 1990s of some of the reality revolution, people like Jeff Thompson and Mo Teague, uh, were uh, trained coaches in combat sports. Uh, they they were very much um, promoters of Western boxing, Muay Thai, uh, judo, wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and mixed martial arts in general. They they believed that these were really really important. Uh, elements to anyone's training but they also would extol the values of traditional karate, traditional silat, uh, so you, you, you're looking at these these martial artists and these people who would come under the, the bracket of people invested in teaching things that are going to work for the everyday person, things that are going to work in civilian self-protection but in fact they sometimes will have traditional hearts and then certainly a basis in traditional martial arts and they will be no strangers to the field of combat sports either. So then we now move into the final one. We move into uh, combat sports. I'd say the final one. I think all three of these categories, I would say, um, as a concept, reality-based self-defense is probably just about the newest, but all three of them are actually quite old, quite ancient, and uh, quite difficult to trace their exact lineages back to say. Uh, you know, we often think of traditional martial arts being the oldest, but you know, combat sports have been around uh, since before there are written records, that's for sure. We have engravings, we have statues um, of, of these uh, different events, and it's involved in a lot of the mythology and religions uh, of ancient times as well, that we have wrestling and boxing, for example, and uh, various different uh, combative sports. So within combat sports, again, what about judo? Judo was a traditional martial art. It has all the trappings of traditional martial arts that many traditional martial arts have copied, have taken on board. Judo came up with the belt system. It was Kano Jigaro, um, an educator, a trained educator uh, in the school system who brought in the belt system for judo. Um, and the use, the universal use of wearing the dogi, wearing the gis, which then were adopted by karate, uh, adopted by aikido, and then adopted over in Korea in the form of the dobok, taekwondo, tang soo do, hapkido, etc. So uh, you're looking at the blueprint for what we see as being traditional martial arts. Certainly, those outside of China and uh, Southeast Asia, anyway, and within that. Um, it comes from what we might see more as a combat sport. Most judo clubs, most judo dojos the world over, uh, are training people for competition. They're very much involved in competitive judo. I know there are exceptions to that. I know there are those people who practice old school judo. Uh, and they, they are pretty much more in line with the traditional way of training. But we would commonly put judo 
in the combat sport bracket. Um, judoka, though, are traditional martial artists. They have a traditional syllabus. They, they follow a, a single language. They have a hierarchy. And they institutionalized all these things. They qualify as a traditional martial art. And as far as the system of self-defense, well, there is an entire area of the original syllabus and curriculum that is dedicated to self-defense. And judo was often promoted as a system of self-defense, at least in the West, um, over in Europe, the UK, and America. Uh, Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, um, again used interchangeably at the time, was put forward as a system of self-defense. And in fact, you know, we look at the history of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it uh, comes from the same place, it comes from, from Judo, but at the time it was often being called as Jiu-Jitsu, hence the reason why Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu kept the term Jiu-Jitsu, uh, and often used Jiu-Jitsu as a direct reference to the more combative roots of Judo, the more self-defense roots, and promoted themselves as a self-defense system. So and yet Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu's long history and presence as a combat sport, whether within its own tournaments, within submission grappling, Vale Tudo or MMA, clearly put it in the sportive tribe. In fact, a lot of the strongest arguments put forward through mixed martial arts and through a lot of the combat sports world come from the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu argument put forward about competition being a good proving ground for self-defense ability. I don't necessarily believe that that's entirely true because I think a salt situation has a different dynamic to a consensual violence to a match situation which is a discussion for another time which I've put across in my podcast and my writings before. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a pretty good area for testing a lot of things and certainly um, elevates people to be better fighters all round. Regardless of the individual flaws of the different schools of thought, there is one major flaw that unites them all. I call this martial arts stylism, and this is really what we're talking about here. This is why we have the three tribes and why the three tribes, more importantly, are at war. Because stylism, because you have a prejudiced approach towards looking at your system or your particular tribe as being superior to the others without stopping and thinking about the contradictions in that particular argument. What shows up this contradiction more than anything else is the simple fact that some of the greatest pioneers of individual martial arts cross-trained and often cross-trained in disciplines that could be found in all three of the different schools of thought. In Chinese martial arts, we often had the argument put forward that they were the most ancient form of combative system. They had the longest lineage and loads of martial arts could be considered to be the children of Kung Fu, the children of Chinese martial arts systems. Uh, some of their greatest pioneers, some of their greatest exponents were active cross trainers from other countries. Tang Yao's classic example, one of my favourite uh, Chinese martial arts historians from the 20th century who heavily criticised the way that a lot of Chinese martial arts were going in the 1920s, trained in Japan, in Japanese martial arts, because he believed at that particular time they were training in more robust systems of combat, that they were pressure testing more, for example. Then you have Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that used stylism a lot in its publicity, putting across the strong point that it was the system of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, not its fighters, that made it so great, that it was the best martial art, like as if it was the perfect martial formula, because it could beat more people in no-holds-barred competitions, and it was proving this in Valley Tudo. Uh, even that had, had exponents like uh, Holes Gracie, who actively trained with the American freestyle wrestlers and the American freestyle wrestling team. They um, actively cross-trained in Sombo. They actively competed against many other different martial artists and definitely absorbed techniques from those other different styles along the way. It, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu came from Judo, which was itself a component of three Jiu-Jitsu schools. Uh, along with extra modifications. The style has evolved, it has progressed, and it has done that through the virtue of training with other martial artists. You can't ignore that fact. It seems to be a simple rule of life. And fighting against it through stylism just limits ourselves. So we find that the cure to stylism uh, is to actively engage in cross-training. And that doesn't necessarily mean just go to as many schools as possible. It doesn't mean become a dojo hopper. Uh, it means opening your mind to different training methods. It means looking across at different systems. And this can also go as far as teaching. 
uh, one lesson I was taught by one of my clients who was a school teacher. He was uh, not only a school teacher, but he also was a jazz musician uh, teacher. Uh, was that my very open way of teaching, the way that I was teaching at that particular time, didn't necessarily suit everybody and wasn't necessarily the most efficient way to train every single individual. I I promoted then, as I promote now, very much a bottom-up, ground-up way of teaching, a way of uh, looking at a student's ability and working with them to improve themselves as individuals. Uh, and this can go to the extent of devising activities and and uh, quarrying from those activities techniques that they can then test and they can make personally their own. Uh, that's the approach I like to do, and I particularly like to do that with martial artists. Now, he had um, relevant experience in martial arts, boxing and judo, quite a lot of years' experience, and um, I tried to use this approach with him initially, and, uh, and it wasn't working very well. Uh, and in the end, I had to default back to a more classical uh, teaching approach, uh, which I which I now use uh, evenly with my with with the way I prefer to teach, and I had to accept the simple fact that my method wasn't necessarily the best for everybody, or wasn't the one that was suited for an individual at that particular time. Even though it seemed to be the most open, even though it seemed to be the method that would be best for um, developing individuals, that would be the least hindered by personal biases and prejudice and stylism it wouldn't necessarily suit every single individual originally. So sometimes you have to start in a different place. So I was tested fairly early on, a willingness to change my style of teaching, a willingness to change my approach, even if the approach I thought I was using was the most liberal and progressive way, is all part of the progressive approach to martial arts, is part of the free thinking approach to martial arts teaching and training. Another lesson I learned came care of a friend of mine who is far more academically educated than I am. We both began our martial arts path together, um, but uh, after I got my black belt, um, he went on to pursue far more academic pursuits and did a hell of a lot better than I did in that respect. Uh, he's a constant source of uh, knowledge and wisdom for me, um, and I consulted him on my approach to teaching and training in life in general and what I was finding was that I never fitted in with any particular group. My cross training has made me very much the vagabond warrior, has made me very much the wonder in terms of that and I don't feel comfortable staying with any particular school. Uh, I've found myself in arguments uh, with whatever school I'm with. Um, I've been with traditionalists um, who don't like my discussions on uh, on violence or my discussions on things from a self protection point of view, getting, uh, drilling deep into the ideas of dealing with civilian uh, violence and how best to deal with that. Uh, they think it's too much of a preoccupation in their discussions. Uh, they'd much rather be talking about the exact uh, degree they put on a certain lock. Th likewise, I've been in the mixed martial arts world where they've found that. Um, their arguments against traditional martial arts are often quite unfair, um, they disregard all the exceptions to the rule, or they don't really understand uh, the basis for some of the traditional martial arts. And I've been in the, and often, as I find myself in the reality-based self-defense world, because uh, self-protection is a big service of mine, I don't find an affinity with most of them. Most of them, I think, um, are if too susceptible to uh, listening to um, popular psychology to uh, media hysteria um, and can get uh, again too heavily involved in the violent side of things um, to the extent that they're not thinking of the legal repercussions or even to the actual efficiency of techniques they'd much rather be invested in the pornography of reality-based self-defense so not really happy in any of the particular groups but I have good friends and there are people who I get on very well from, well from all those different groups, so I have a huge respect for them all as well. So with that all in mind and looking at things from a philosophical point of view, I say that, you know, at times I'm very much a optimistic and hopeful person and I think that's important. I've got a good degree of positive thinking in my personality and in my motivation, but I also believe in negative thinking. I do believe in practical uh, pessimism. Um, you know, you can't write a risk assessment using positive thinking. 
overall realistic thinking and critical thinking uh, are the uh, main drivers behind my approach to martial arts but it doesn't mean that I can't see the benefits taken from the other side of things. I think there are uh, plenty of valuable lessons that we can learn from different philosophies. So looking at traditionalism, modernism and postmodernism, I see that traditionalism can present us with uh, systems that have proven to produce effective people, um, have consistently good rules and instructions that can make for um, good combative systems. I think that that uh, would be a good rule learned from a traditionalist point of view. From a modernist point of view, boiling things down to their basic uh, components is a very, very good system. I think certainly when you're trying to teach a self-protection course, you should have that approach. You should have a very strict minimalist approach. Um, and, but also accepting the postmodernist um, view that everything works and nothing works is also a sobering thought. Anyway, looking at these ideas, um, I put it forward to him, well, you know, where do I go with that? Where, do, where am I generally leaning? And he said, it doesn't really matter. See them as portals. And I thought, well, this is the same thing as I've been preaching about martial arts. They're not entities. They're not, uh, they're not physical things. They are tools um, from a mental perspective. They are guidelines. Um, there's a lot that you can get out of them. But in the end, it's, it is down to you and it's down to what you make of them. But you shouldn't feel bonded to any particular system, to any particular martial art, or even to any particular instructor for that matter. Um, you, that you're in a, a relationship with your instructor. You're in a, um, a learning relationship with the instructor. And, they, and, and that... Um, shouldn't be a controlling situation. You should be um, looking towards just uh, living your life the best that you can and to improve your skills the best that you can. And that shouldn't be limited by any school of thought. Uh, again, you see them as portals. See them as vehicles for that particular journey and change vehicles as time goes on. Um, go across and try different ones. Um, Cross-training will always be the cure to stylism. Thank you for watching, guys. I'd love to hear your feedback and comments in the comments section. Uh, don't forget to check out clubcarmira.com.